Uh, last time in the first lecture on this singular value decomposition, we have three lectures coming up. Uh, the second lecture, I want to start focusing in on what good is this uh, singular value decomposition for. What I showed last time is just how would you construct this, that you can take a matrix, right, and decompose it into these three matrices, where you think about these matrices as being basically you take some data set, and what it does is it rotates, stretches, and rotates the data. Okay, so what those, uh, those matrices do for you. Uh, moreover, it was also a theorem that for any matrix I have, a singular value decomposition exists for it. Okay? So I want to start building on this theme towards, uh, towards the third lecture, uh, which we're going to do what are called eigenfaces, or we're going to do uh, principal components for face recognition. So it's like a software or methods for recognizing faces. So we'll talk about that in the next lecture. But I want to start giving you an intuitive feel of what this method does in allowing you to analyze data. So I titled this lecture Principal Component Analysis. And often that's called PCA. And you'll see this dropped around in conversations once in a while, principal components. Um, it, with some slight modification, it's also sometimes known as the proper orthogonal decomposition, the Carhoen Leuven, those are like some Dutch guys, uh, expansion, uh, Hotling transform, empirical orthogonal functions. These are all different names for basically what is essentially the same. They're all the same name for essentially this thing here is just going to be essentially just the singular value decomposition. So I'm going to try to motivate what we're doing today with an example, a physical example, and one that you already kind of know the solution to. So let me draw what it is. Consider the following physical setup. I have some kind of rod sticking out here and suspended from this rod there is a spring and this spring is attached to a mass. Okay. Now what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to just pull this mass down and let it go. Okay. Now this mass has some or this spring has some spring constant k, and uh, you know normally if you just let this thing go, what it's going to just do is just oscillate up and down. Of course, I could swing it and so forth, but for right now, let's just constrain it to the fact that I can exactly release it from underneath, and it's going to just start to oscillate. Okay, so that's the physical system we have. Now, to measure what's going on with this, we might have some function f of t. that measures the displacement of this thing as it oscillates. Okay? So that's, uh, that's it. Now what do we know about this? Well, what we do know about this is that it's governed by force equals mass times acceleration. Okay? So that is what the governing equations are for this. And in fact, if I write that down, uh, F equals ma, right? So we we know that this is a, a very important law from Newton. And what Newton came up with is this idea of also calculus. He said, well, look, I have this mass. Acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. Velocity is the derivative of position. So really, acceleration is the second derivative of the position. In this case here, that's the f. Okay, so ma. Now what are the forces acting on this thing? Well, gravity, right? So I have mg going in the negative direction, right? So that's kind of how you might think about this system, is you could write this down in some force, but you have the gravity here, but then you also have just the spring restoring force, right? So if you say, you know, at equilibrium, the gravity holds it here, and then if I displace, what pulls it back up is a spring, and if you push it up, the spring then compresses, it pushes it back down. 
And if you use, use what's called Hooke's Law, then what you end up getting is this thing sort of looks like your force of the restoring force of the spring comes to be out something like this. Okay, simple. You could solve this. And let's just write down the solution we know. And by the way, right away when I draw this picture, you already know how to think about a coordinate system. You might think of a coordinate system as x, y, z. Well, clearly the z direction is up, and the x, y plane is down here, and my solution would look something like this. I have something that oscillates in time. So actually I should, sorry, I, put, I should make this T a Z. So I just pretend I did. So you just have this thing oscillating and there's the solution. So in fact you could do this for any, you know, beginning of physics class. You're doing often working with these mass spring systems and there's your solution. Or there's your setup to the equation. Now in this case it's so simple, you know what the answer is. You know, if you release this thing, it's just going to oscillate. Now, of course, there's other things in here. There's damping, and so eventually it'll stop. But let's consider sort of this ideal system where there's no damping, no friction, no noise, and I release it exactly right, so it just sits there. And so really, it's just oscillating in this little, in the Z direction. It's a one degree of freedom system. That's it. Okay. Everybody okay with that? That's the, that's the basic setup. I mean, that's a, a well-known problem. Now let's take a very different viewpoint of this problem. Bring my over here. And let's wipe this out. I have a spring mass system. And now let's take a data-driven approach. What I mean by that is, suppose I didn't know f equals ma. In fact, suppose that cameras had been invented before f equals ma. So here's the question to ask. Is it possible, from just taking data alone, could I have inferred f equals ma from the data? So in other words, I'm going to take probes, I'm going to place them in the system, and I'm going to watch this system evolve. And I'm going to try to first of all figure out, like, so first of all, how complex is this system? Can I get an idea of that? So what I'm going to do is take this system and I'm going to put measurements on it. In particular, I'm going to have cameras. So let me try to draw a camera. Camera one, or let's actually call this camera A, stay consistent, or camera one, who cares? So this is camera one. And then I might have another camera over here looking at this thing. And one I'm going to maybe one over here. I film this thing. I start at a given time. I set this thing going. I film. And I'll say this is camera two. And this is camera three. My objective now is to try to figure out, just from the data itself, can I say something about this underlying system here. Now remember, I already know the solution to it. But in many cases, you don't know the physics of what's going on underneath there. You just have this system where all you can do is take measurements on it. And what you're trying to do is figure out what is going on in the system that produces these measurements. That's what we're going to try to do here. We're going to try to do it here, knowing that, in fact, we already know the governing equations underneath. OK. So what do we do? We take some timestamps, and from camera one, I take the following data. What does that mean? Well, remember back here on the camera, this is taking some snapshot of it here. I'm seeing this thing moving around. So, you know, in my, in my box here, this weight is going up and down. And what I have is, you know, in the frame of reference of my camera, there's a certain x direction and a y direction, right, in this camera frame. So, 
Whenever I look at this thing, I calculate where is this position of this mass in the x and the y direction in the frame of reference of that camera as I take snapshots of it in time. And I collect them. So here's the x location in the reference frame of the camera, the y location in the reference frame of the camera. And I can do the same thing for camera 2 and camera 3. So it's three sets of recordings. X A Y A pair, which is the X and Y position in the camera frame of where this mass is. The X B Y B, which are the mass in the frame of reference of camera two. X C Y C mass in the reference frame of camera three. Okay? So this is all my data. By the way, at this point, right, if you think about this, uh, there is no x, y coordinates. Like, you know, when I look at this thing, of course, I can say, oh, you know, x and y is here, z is in the up direction. But remember, suppose, it's, it's, it's already making use of the fact that you know the answer. Suppose you just have measurements and that's all, and you're just trying to figure out what's, what is in here, in fact, in the first place. And what's it doing? What is the dimensionality of the dynamics that's going on here? We already know it's one dimensional, it's going like this. The question is, can we reconstruct that directly from the data? So what I'm going to do is make a data matrix. I'm going to make a matrix X. And what I'm going to do is in the first row, I'm going to put X of A. And in the second row, put Y of A. Then X of B, Y of B, X of C, Y sub C. There is all my data arranged. Six rows. So I took all my data, I put it all in here. So this is all the data I have, and then we start to address two fundamental issues associated with this data. Noise, what's called redundancy. What you know is these cameras, they're not perfect. So whenever you take in your pixels, probably some noise in those in your images. Not only that, maybe the person holding the camera is shaking it a little bit. So you're introducing noise into the system that doesn't give you a perfect representation of the data. And having a lot of noise can obviously affect things a great deal because you're no longer looking just at the data, you're looking at the data with noise on top of it. And if you have too much noise on top of it, you're not going to make any sense of the data. Okay? So hopefully there's a way to control that. The bigger thing we want to focus in on is this idea of redundancy. Okay? What do I mean by redundancy? Camera 1, camera 2, camera 3. They each pull in X A Y A, Y X B, X Y B Y B, X C Y C. I could ask the question is, are these measurements independent of each other? In other words, when this thing is taking a picture of this thing going, is my X coordinate, does it behave independently of the Y coordinate? And right away you know that's not true because if you take a picture of this, so you see this mass in your camera, and how it's changing in X and Y, it's related, right? There's a trajectory it's on, and it happens to be that X and Y are intimately tied together. And by the way, if I take a recording here and here, uh, this is going to give me basically the same information as here, just from a different angle. These are going to be related, and this is going to be related, especially if it's just this thing going up and down. In fact. What is the degree of freedom of this system? If you look at it, if I release it straight up, straight up and down, it's one degree of freedom. Yet, what I have are one, two, three, four, five, six sets of data. All I really needed was 
one set of data to get everything I needed. Right? If I could take a picture, knowing how it lines up, take a picture like this so that the camera, the Z direction in the, is this way, and the camera, when I hold it, it's level in the XY plane, and then all I need is just the Z direction dynamics, and that's it. It's one degree of freedom. But the fact is, normally with your data, you don't know how to take that perfect picture ahead of time. And what principal components is going to tell you is, oh, I don't need all these cameras. All I needed was one camera at this angle, and it would give me the whole thing. Okay? That's what we're aiming for. But we're not there yet. We need to figure out the methodology to get there. So I'm going to introduce some concepts. Variance and covariance. OK, these are statistical ideas. And the variance and covariance are going to tell you how, essentially, there's two really key statistical properties often people talk about. One is the mean, the mean and the variance. So if you think about a Gaussian distribution of variables where there's some bell curve, something like this, this would be the mean. And there's a variance which tells you sort of how fat this thing is. OK? That's a, a, a conception that you might have, which is there's this idea of a variance which tells you what's the distribution of the sizes. In other words, what's the width of this distribution okay, on a bell curve. So how do we compute these things? All right, well, consider two vectors, A, which is you know some components A1, A2, all the way to A of N and a vector b. And let's say that these two things are collections of data, a and b. And what I would really like to understand is there a relationship between a and b. In particular, if I think of a as a set of data and b as a set of data, I could ask the following question. Uh, are these two data sets sort of statistically independent? Or are they related somehow statistically? In other words, when I look at A, I could tell you something about B, or vice versa. So this is what variance and covariance gives you. Uh, or covariance tells you how they're related. But variance tells you something simple. Let's, let's for a moment assume that the, the mean of A and B are 0. Okay, It's going to be our assumption for a moment and mean of a and b are 0, then I can define this quantity of the variance as being the following. Sigma squared a, this data set, is the following. 1 over n minus 1, where n is the total number of points, a, a transpose. So I take this vector, multiply by the transpose, so this a vector, and then I transpose it, turns it into column vector, and I can do this multiplication. And what is this? It's an inner product. This tells me the length of the vector, essentially. OK? So if this inner product is big, it means there's lots of variance. If this inner product is small, there's very little variance. Same thing here with B. OK. So there's the variance of A, there's the variance of B. Let me give you an example of something that might have high variance versus low variance. Suppose I have some signal like this, like a sine wave. Well, uh, so first of all, what is the mean of this thing? Well, it's zero. But the variance is related to how big my excursions are out here. Okay, so I have big excursions, like lots of big oscillations then I have a high variance. And you want to see a little low variance? Right there. Small sine wave. So that would be like a small variance. This is a large variance. Remember, it tells me the fat, how fat my distribution of values are. Okay? So if I were to put this on a bell curve, I could see that like, you know, I'm spending a lot of time in here, less on the edges. But still, look, for this big amplitude thing, my values are very spread out. For this small one, the variance is almost 0. Hardly any oscillations at all. 
Okay, so that's a that's a, an intuitive concept of variance, and so what this tells you is how large the changes are in some sense in the data in A. This tells you how large the changes are in the data values of B. Okay. All right. So that's the idea of variance, and this will play a very key role in the singular value decomposition. The more important quantity we want to focus in on for a second is what's called the covariance. And this is measuring the statistical relationship between data in A and data in B. In particular, What it is is an inner product between the matrix, the vector, the data A and the and the data B. These two uh, vectors, and you get a score. And this tells you the covariance. Here's what's kind of interesting about this score: if A and B were both of length one, let's say, let's say they were a bunch of data, mean zero, but their length, in other words, this was length one, that's length one. Then what this is is just simply an inner product or a dot product. What it does, it tells you how much of A and B are in the same direction. If A and B are exactly in the same direction, in other words, A is equal to B, then this thing would be 1. That's the maximum covariance score you can get. However, if A and B are really different directions, and in fact, if A inner product B is 0, then A and B essentially have nothing to do with each other. The data here is orthogonal to the data there. Okay? So in some sense you can think of A is in this direction, B is in this direction, and what this measure tells you is just the dot product. It tells you how much of B is in A. Well, you can look in that direction, do a little projection down here, that much. And by the way, this is how much in the opposite direction. So when you start looking at this, if A and B are like this, orthogonal to each other, then A has nothing to do with B. Okay? So in this sense, when you get a covariance at zero, A and B are thought to be statistically independent. However, if A and B go in the same direction, you know, here's A, here's B on top of it, you know, basically then they're the same vector. They're completely, uh, they're just the same. They're statistically dependent. Now, more generally, you kind of get something like where A and B, they're not either completely orthogonal nor are they on top of each other. So they have some overlap, and so there's some kind of statistical dependence. Uh, and the measure of how much statistical, statistical dependence is given by this quantity right here. Okay. Now, how does this pertain to what we've been talking about? Let's come back over to this board over here, and let's talk about this experiment. What I really want to understand, because I already know this to be true, is that when I take these three different cameras filming the same simple experiment that just does this. What I see from this camera and this camera and this camera are not statistically independent. They have some kind of covariance. What happens here is directly related to what happens there and what's directly related to what happens here. All I've done is taken this thing and I've filmed it in three different frames of reference. But the fact of the matter, all this data, a lot of it's redundant because so much of it is correlated. That's this idea of redundancy. What I'd really like to do in systems where I have a lot of data, I would like to remove redundant information. In other words, I know this system, it's a one degree of freedom system, but I've taken six degrees of freedom of information. What I'd really like to do is reduce this from six back down to one in some self-consistent fashion. It's a one degree of freedom system, yet I have six degrees of freedom. 
how do I do that reduction? So in other words, I have five degrees of freedom that are redundant and I have to remove them. Okay, so this is the idea of thinking about it. Here's the formal way you want to start thinking about this, which is the A and B matrices or A and B vectors of data have these variant scores. Tells you how much each of those directions is really changing, how vigorous the dynamics is in that direction. And this tells you how the two sets of data are correlated to each other. Okay? Variance, covariance. But the fact of the matter is here, we don't just have two data, two vectors, we have actually have six. In fact, in general, you'd have lots of vectors of data. So what we want to do is construct what's called the covariant matrix. So let me erase this. And suppose I have a bunch of data, and what I like to do is, with all that data, is remove redundancy. So I'm going to construct what's called C of X, which is defined the following way. I generalize from vectors to matrices. All I do is say, look, I'm going to look at covariance among all pairs of data vectors. So there's going to be a matrix. I have this 1 over n minus 1 factor, which provides what's called an unbiased estimator. <coughs> Who cares? It's a scaling factor. And then I have this quantity here. My data matrix times the transpose of the data matrix. What this does is it takes each vector and multiplies and calculates not only the variance, because if you take uh, here, if you take first row, first column, that gives you the variance because it's the same vector, but now when you do first row, second column, it gives you the covariance between the first data set and the second data set. Okay? Uh, what does this thing look like in the context of this data in particular? Right? I have x of a, y sub a, x of b, y sub b, x of c, y sub c. Six sets of data. Okay? And what I want to do is essentially calculate how does this one correlate to this one? How does that one correlate to that one? How does that correlate to this, this to this, this to this? That's an important thing to do. And then I can ask, well, what about y of a? How does it correlate to this, to itself, which is the variance? this guy, to this guy, to this guy, to this guy. And you can do this with all pairs. All pairs of vector you want to check. So in this case here, we have six measurements. This thing here is a six by six matrix. And let's write down what the components looks like or what they look like. Well, in the first here, you have sigma squared of xa, xa. In other words, what is the variance of the vector x of a. But now, in the second component, it's you're cal computing the covariance between x of a, y sub a. So you get sigma squared, x of a, y sub a, and then sigma squared, x of a, um, x of b. I better make this a bit bigger. Sigma squared, uh, x of a, y sub b, sigma squared, x of a, um, x of c, sigma squared, x of a, y sub c. That is the first row of that matrix. So what do I have here? I have one, var one variance score, which is, hey, what is the variance of the xa direction? In other words, how much is it changing in the xa direction? So I can compute that, right? So this is a, an inner product of xa with itself. But then it says, yeah, but what's the inner product of x a with y sub a? Because that's going to give me a score about how x of a and y of a are related, and then how x of a and x of b are related, how x of a and y sub b are related, and so forth. And in the second column, you'd have sigma squared x of a, x of b, or sorry. So here we're really computing for, you get x of b, x of a, you get sigma squared x of b, x of b, sigma squared, x of b, um, uh, y, uh, sorry, 
shoot, sorry, 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 hold on. So this is, <laughs> this is the y sub a row, sorry about that. So this is get y sub a, x of a, sigma squared, y sub a, y sub a, sigma squared, y sub a, x of b, and so forth. And then you get sigma squared here. This is now where you get x of b, x of a. You get sigma squared, x of uh, b, y sub a. And then on the diagonal, x, uh, sigma squared, x of b, x of b, and so forth. So this is kind of the structure of this 6 by 6 matrice matrix. Now I want to point out one thing. Look at the diagonal terms. Here they are. What do the diagonals tell you? Oh, it's the variance of x, a, the variance of y, a, variance of x, b, and so forth. So on the diagonals, one of the things to notice, this covariant matrix, uh, on the diagonals are the variance measures. What about on the off diagonals? On the off diagonals, now you have all the covariance scores. You have x, a, y, a. That tells you how x, a, and y, a are, are basically uh, correlated. x, a, x, b, x, a, y, b, and so forth. And notice, sigma squared x, a, y, a is the same as x, sigma squared y, a, x, a, a. So it's symmetric. So this matrix that comes out, the 6 by 6, so first of all, this off diagonal terms, they're all symmetric. So wherever you are on this side, you go across the diagonal, it's the same. This is the same as this, and so forth. So it's a symmetric matrix. Or another way to say a symmetric matrix, self-adjoint. Or another way to say it, Hermitian, for instance. Those are different. They all mean the same thing. So the off-diagonal terms give you your covariance scores between all pairs. OK? So this matrix becomes important because this matrix is telling us something very fundamental about our measurements. It tells us how each vector is changing and how vectors are related to each other. Let, let's, let's go one step further. What does it mean to have small values, small off-diagonal elements? So if you go on the off diagonals, if they're very small, what does that mean? So very small question mark. So, so for instance, take this x a y sub b. This is the variance, covariance score between x a and the y of b component. And a very small, it means these two vectors are basically orthogonal and they don't have really anything to do with each other. So if it's very small, they are essentially statistically independent. In other words, one vector doesn't really have much to do with the other. However, if they're big or moderate sized, what does that mean? If this is pretty big, it means x a and y sub b have a big inner product. It means the two vectors have a lot of stuff that they share. Okay, so if they're very big, they're statistically dependent. And another way to say that is they have a lot of redundancy. So this is how you start identifying redundancy, in fact. As you can say, look, the off-diagonal elements, if they're big, are telling me the kind of measures and scores that, in fact, produce a lot of redundancy. Okay. Now let's talk about the diagonals and the variance. Uh, we're going to make an assumption here, which is if you look at these, if there's a big variance score, that means that vector is changing a lot. In other words, it has a lot of stuff happening. Whereas if it's really small, not much is going on. We're going to make an assumption that 
if the, the diagonal terms that are big, they're the ones that matter. That's where all the system stuff is happening. The stuff that's small, not much is going on there. Okay, this is gonna, it's an assumption, but we're going to use it. Okay, so this matrix tells us a lot already. By the way, if you want to compute this in MATLAB, you want to know the covariance scores, you just do this. Take your data matrix that you build, say covariance X, and what it's going to give you is this matrix. It's going to compute uh, the variance along the diagonals, the covariance on the off diagonals. That's it. Okay? All right. And now what we're interested in now is once we get this is to say I'd like to remove redundancy. I have all these things out here, these covariances telling me, oh, that's big, that's big, that's big. It means the data is very strongly related. What do I want to do? What I really want to do is what's called diagonalize the system. I would like to do the following. I would really like to change the basis I'm working in so that this thing here becomes diagonal. I want to make this diagonal. That, 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 uh, that is my big goal. It's so big, I wrote big letters and all caps. That's like I'm shouting it, okay? <laughs> That's how important it is. You want to make this diagonal. What does it mean for this thing to be diagonal? If all these non-diagonal terms are zero, it means that the correlation in this new frame of reference between different pairs, if they're zero, that means they're completely statistically independent. There is no redundancy. In other words, if I can put this in a diagonal way, so I have CX, it just looks like some stuff on the diagonals and zeros everywhere else, I've removed all redundancies from the system. In other words, in this frame of reference, there are no redundancies. I've removed them all from the data. What's left? The diagonal terms. And if I can diagonalize, and I can order the diagonal so that the biggest are here and the smallest are there, the biggest diagonals are going to tell me the dynamics that are the strongest. And the, the ones that are much smaller, they're kind of not doing much in the system. I'm going to order them biggest to largest. Hey, by the way, does this look familiar? A diagonal matrix order from biggest to smallest. This is starting to look like our SVD. And all it's really doing in the data management sense is to say, look, I have a bunch of data. I don't know what it represents. Let's say I take a bunch of measurements. And what I'd really like to do with all these measurements is say, OK, look, I got some noise. I'm not sure how to take care of the noise. But what I know for sure is that maybe if I have all these sensors, what I really want to find out is how big is the underlying system? How much of the data collection that I did uh, is independent or is the same or is redundant? And this is the way to do it. This is the way to check that. You can move to a frame to make that diagonal. And in making that diagonal, you've removed all redundancy. And then you can look at the diagonals to tell you which directions or which variances matter. Anything that's near zero, you could say, that's not much is going on. I'll throw it away. And it's going to just leave you now fully removal, full removal of redundancy. And the only thing left over is going to be now um, things that matter, things that have large variance. That is our goal, diagonalization. All right, ready? I'm, I'm going to break out a color marker. <laughs> diagonalization is a very important, critical thing to do. Uh, when you look at dynamics or any kind of system like this. And by the way, you're already familiar with diagonalization from eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And I'm going to show you the connection to those, and then I'll show you the connection to the SVD. Okay. So let's start taking a look at this thing and take a look at our data matrix X. So let's come back over here and start thinking about this diagonalization idea. 
uh, we'll erase our original system here. And remember that we have a matrix X. This is our data matrix. That is critical for understanding everything we want to do. Now what I'm going to do is I can start looking at that correlation matrix. And what I know I'm going to compute is something that looks like this, x, x transpose. And of course, there's a scaling factor 1 over n. But the point is, this pretty much is going to tell me uh, what's going on in that matrix. right? If I do this, the diagonals are the variances of each individual measure. The off diagonals are essentially the covariance or correlations among pairs of data. Okay. Now, what you've already covered in eigenvalues and eigenvectors is that any matrix like this, and by the way, this now, this matrix here, I've already said, is symmetric. Okay, it's symmetric or self-adjoint, which means it has real eigenvalues. And in fact, I can always do now, if I have a symmetric matrix like that, I can always do what's called an eigenvalue decomposition into this form here. Where what is S? S is a matrix of the eigenvalues, of eigenvectors, excuse me. Okay, so I take the eigenvectors of this matrix, and by the way, again, since it is a symmetric matrix, I know what I have are real eigenvalues, and all the eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other. And with those orthogonal eigenvectors, I make this. And by the way, since they're orthogonal to each other, S itself is a unitary transformation. So inverse of S is the same as S star. Well, it's actually even better. It's S transpose. And this is the capital lambda. This is a diagonal matrix. with the eigenvalues of x, x transpose. Okay. That decomposition decomp always works, provided, you know, certainly if you have a symmetric real matrix like this, which is what this produces, this is always guaranteed to hold. And then you get these unitary transformations in a diagonal matrix with eigenvalues on it. OK. So here's what I'm going to do. What we already learned is that, you know, when I took the data, I just picked some random arbitrary coordinate system. What I'd really like to do, coming back to here, let's go to here. Remember, my goal is to take this thing here, which is just took a bunch of data in an arbitrary system, and I got this interesting thing. And by understanding what this covariance matrix tells me, what I really want to do is make this thing diagonal. In other words, what I really want to do is figure out what is the what is the basis modes, or what are the what are the frame of reference I should have used in the first place, so that what I would get instead of this matrix here with all these off diagonals and a bunch of redundant measurements. Then I get this guy. Do you hear that? This guy, gal. I don't know. Can't tell the difference between guy and gal with these matrices. But the point is, I want it to be diagonal, and that matters a lot. So I come over here and I say, that's what I want to do. And a simple way to think about that is say, OK, how about we write this? Let's make up a new set of measurements, which are related to the old set of measurements by this matri matrix S times X. Remember, X is my original set of measurements. And I want to say that's going to be, uh, I want to work in this new basis, new frame of reference. Uh, it's just a transformation. I transform from what I had to a, a new set of references. Let's calculate the covariance of this. What is it? 
1 over n minus 1, y, y transpose. Okay, I'm just using the covariance formula that we had before. But notice, what do I get here? This is now S transpose X, S transpose X transpose, which S transpose X, the transpose comes in, you get X transpose X, the S there. Oh, but look, X times X transpose, isn't that this right there? So I can replace that there, say 1, n minus 1, s transpose, and then I get s diagonal, s minus 1, but that's really s transpose s, and notice what happens, s transpose s, 1, s transpose s, 1. This whole thing comes down to, and what is that, lambda? Diagonal matrix. So in other words, if you work in this basis here, y, then the covariance matrix is diagonal. So what I did, effectively then, is I figured out the right way to look at this problem. What does this correspond to? I took those three cameras. It's like, oh, I'm going to replace it all. In fact, by the way, when you do this and it's really a single degree, you know what happens to all the variance scores? There's only one non-zero variance score. So even though you get this, what it is, that matrix, is some number here, blah, zeros, and zeros everywhere else. What does that mean? It means there's one direction that matters, the z direction, and has this variance. And it tells you how large the amplitude fluctuations are of the mass. I just diagonalized. And it told me it's a single degree of freedom system. That is the diagonalization process. This is this idea of taking it from the frame of reference you measure it into and make a transform so that you get basically a, st a structure where all the redundancies have been removed. So this is if you're doing it with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And you can do the same thing with singular value decomposition. So let me erase this and start talking about singular value decomposition because it's another way to get to it besides doing eigenvectors and eigenvalues, which is, let's write it in terms of u star x, where u star is the u matrix out of my singular value decomposition. Remember, I can take any data matrix A and decompose it into a u, a sigma, and a v matrix. I'm taking out the u from it. So in other words, this data matrix X, I can decompose it into U, sigma, V star. Guaranteed. And if I do that, represent everything there and Y, then I can do the same calculation. What is the covariance now in this new frame of reference? Remember, all it does is takes my data and rotates it into a new frame of reference. But here's the cool thing about putting in this new frame of reference. What is my covariance in this matrix, new frame of reference? 1 mi n minus 1, y, y transpose. And if you work this all out, it's right there in the notes, you get the following. You get this score right there. So if you get this score, this here is the middle matrix of your SVD squared. So in other words, These are your principal component basis right here, these U. So if you take a data matrix, you do the decomposition, U itself will allow you to transform now into a frame of reference where your covariance matrix is diagonal. And notice the connection. Sigma squared is the same as the eigenvalue matrix, or said another way, each eigenvalue lambda i is right, is equal to sigma i squared. That is a connection between the singular values and the eigenvalues. Okay, we're going to continue more on this uh, in the third lecture, but the key idea is here. This is it right here. 
When I took the data from that spring mass system, what I actually did is I took the data and I, right, I, trans I, I just randomly picked spots to take measurements. These weren't the right spots to take measurements. I mean, if I look at the spring system, all I have to do is take a measurement along the Z direction. But my cameras didn't know this ahead of time. What this tells you is say, look, take your data, and what I'll do with all that data is I'll stack it up, I will do an SVD decomposition, and this U matrix that comes out is right, it's a, it's a, it's a rotation, it's a transformation. So take your data and transform it according to this, and now in this new frame of reference, everything's diagonalized. So now, essentially what you did is took all the data, you removed all redundancy, and you actually even lined it up along the direction of motion. This is what this thing tells you. Now I'm going to use this to great effect in the next lecture to do face recognition. Most important lecture of your life. The SVD is awesomeness. Awesomeness in a, it's awesomeness. Uh, and we're going to hit at least one awesome application uh, in the third lecture. But uh, you should never forget this. Okay, that's it.